Church, we're so glad you are here with us as we continue our series that we started last week called Serious Joy based on the book of Philippians. You know, C.S. Lewis said that joy is the serious business of heaven, that God is serious about you experiencing joy in every season and in every situation. And that's what the book of Philippians is all about. And so today, I want to talk about how you can experience joy in humility. You know that the earth is not the center of the universe, right? Like, like, like the center of our solar system, our universe, it's not the earth, right? The sun and all the planets don't revolve around the earth, now, right? Like now I know that at one point in time that was a revolutionary concept because at one point in time everyone thought that the earth was the center of the universe. They thought that, you know, the sun and every, all the other planets, they all revolved around the earth. But in the 16th century, there was an astronomer named Nicholas Copernicus who discovered that the sun was actually the center of the universe and that the earth and everything else revolved around the sun. And this belief was very controversial in his day, but it changed the way that we see the world. And so his belief that earth was not the center of the universe became known as the Copernican Revolution. Now, in the 20th century, a Swiss psychologist named Jean Valjean came along and said that each child must experience their own Copernican Revolution. Right? Every child must come to learn that they are not the center of the universe. Because how many of you know kids grow up into this world believing they are the center of the universe, right? They believe that every desire should be fulfilled. They think that walls should move when they run into them. Floors should become soft when they fall onto them. They believe that they should get whatever they want whenever they want it. Can I get an amen from the parents today? Yes, yes, if you have kids, let me know, right? That's how toddlers think, right? But eventually, they need to come to the place where they realize they are not the center of the universe. They need a Copernican revolution. My, my two-year-old, uh, uh, he's now two, getting ready to be three, but he started to transition through his Copernican revolution right at the age of two. We're not fully there yet, but we're working on it. But this kid, when he was going through it, it was so emotional for him because anytime something did not go his way, he would throw himself on the floor, hands in his face, screaming and crying like the world was ending over everything, right? It's like, shoes, you're gonna wear these. I don't want these ones. And he'd throw himself on the floor over and over again, right? And so toddlers need a Copernican revolution, but I don't think they're the only ones. I think everyone needs to come to the realization that they are not the center of the universe, which is tough because we live in a culture and in an age that is obsessed with self. Right, it's all about self-realization, self-actualization, self-fulfillment, self-improvement, self-perception, self-worth, self-esteem, self-help, self-care, right? We are obsessed with self. And I think the ultimate picture of our preoccupation with self is, of course, the selfie, right? Uh, The word selfie was first used in 2004 on Flickr, but it didn't really become popular until 2006 when MySpace came out. Come on, how many of you had a MySpace account? Where are my MySpace people at? How many of you have never heard of MySpace? You've never heard of MySpace? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're like, what what is that? You've never heard of it. That's because three years later, 2009, Facebook came out and they put MySpace out of business. But the selfie revolution didn't fully kick into gear until 2010 because there was a significant breakthrough in technology. Apple released the iPhone 4 with the first self-facing camera. See, before this, it was really hard to take selfies, but the self-facing camera made it easier than ever, which led to the selfie craze in our world today. Every day, 93 million selfies are taken. The average millennial is expected to take more than 25,000 selfies in a lifetime. 25,000. Y'all didn't laugh at that. We must have a lot of millennials in this service right now. Y'all, every other service is like, oh, that's funny. Y'all are like, oh my God, this is my life. It's hitting too close to home right here. All right. All right. Women between the ages of 16 to 25 spend five hours a week taking selfies. Five hours a week. Wow. And guys are laughing right now, but here's the worst part. Guys in that age bracket actually take more selfies than women. (laughs) 
Come on, I promise you, you take any guy's phone between 16 to 25 and you look at all them gym selfies he has on his phone, just the amount of selfies he takes in the bathroom of a gym where it will add up to five hours a week. I thought I'd share some of my favorite selfies with you. All right, here we go. This is the fighter pilot selfie. Come on. That's pretty awesome right there, right? Uh, I'm not much of a selfie guy, but if I was a fighter pilot launching missiles, I would definitely take this selfie right here. That's awesome. All right, this is the Inception selfie. This is a selfie within a selfie. No, go back, go back, go back. Go back. To the, there we go. This is the selfie within a selfie within a selfie within a selfie within a selfie. <sighs> Mind blown right there. All right, next one. This is the I survived a plane crash selfie. <laughs> Legit. I mean, what do you do when you almost die because your plane crashes in the middle of the ocean? He's like, Sophie. And he looks pretty happy considering his plane just crashed and he's stranded in the middle of the ocean. All right, next one. Come on, lawnmower selfie. You know, you got to take a picture with the most important thing. Why is this dude holding a lawnmower, too? It's like, it's not just with his new mower. He's like, no, me and my girl right here. All right. Law selfie. That's why I put that one in there. I just wanted to hear that noise right there. All right. Running with the bull selfie. Come on, right? If you're going to run and have bulls chase you, you got to take a picture. Uh, you got to get that selfie in there to prove that you actually did it. And here's the top of the building selfie. Yeah, this is real. It's not photoshopped at all. That is absolutely real. Climb to the top of that thing. How many of you, it makes you kind of sick watching that that. Yeah, it, it just take that take that off the screen. That's I it makes me sick looking at that thing. Between the year 2011 and 2017, 259 people died from selfie related accidents, while only 50 people died from shark attacks. There were more deaths by selfie than by sharks. I wonder if the Discovery Channel is going to do a selfie week like they do a shark week. <laughs> I need someone to get me somebody in the network. I'm going to pitch them that show idea right there, right? But, but we live in a world that is obsessed with self. It's all about me, my selfie, and I, right? Everything in our world is designed around our preferences, likes, and desires. You can get whatever you want whenever you want it, except baby formula, right? But everything else, come on. I've got a six-week-old. It's a struggle, y'all. But basically, besides formula, which is needed to keep infants alive, you can get anything that you want whenever you want it, right? It's the world that we live in, right? Even with the supply chain issues we got going on, there is still more available to us at our fingertips that we have in our lives than any other generation in the history of the world. Yet we live in a time where more people struggle with anxiety and depression than ever before. We live in a time where more people are frustrated and unhappy with their lives than ever before in the history of the world. And it's never been better, which means having everything tailored to our preferences has not increased the quality of our lives at all. That having all of our desires fulfilled doesn't fulfill us. Getting everything we want doesn't give us what we want because joy, happiness, and contentment isn't found in living for yourself. It's found in living for others. Serious joy is not found when you focus on yourself. It's found when you focus on others. And Philippians chapter two is all about how to move from selfish living to selfless living, right? Let's pick it up. Philippians two, verse three. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Right, so here it gives us two things that we're not supposed to do. And, and these two things it tells us not to do are the same two things that got Satan kicked out of heaven. Selfish ambition and vain conceit, right? Those are the two things that got him kicked out of heaven, which means we are never more like Satan than when we are selfish, and we are never more like Christ than when we are selfless. The primary characteristic of Satan is selfishness, and the primary characteristic of Christ is selflessness, right? Satan was the creature who wanted to become the creator, but Jesus was the creator who was willing to become the creature. It's the exact opposite. Selfish ambition refers to somebody who advances at the expense of others, right? There, there, there's nothing wrong with somebody advancing or experiencing success just as long as you don't get there at the expense of other people, just as long as you're not putting other people down so that you can get higher, right? And then vain conceit refers to somebody who has an exaggerated view of themselves. 
there was a study done at the University of California where they wanted to find college students, what they thought about themselves versus what others who knew them thought about them. And so in the study, the students rated themselves higher than others when it came to cheerfulness, warmth, and intelligence, right? That's how they saw themselves, cheerful, warm, and intelligent, right? And not just average, but above average in these three areas. The people who knew them, though, they described them as hostile, deceitful, and condescending, (laughs) Right? They did not have an accurate view of themselves. They had an exaggerated view of themselves. And so Philippians tells us, hey, don't do anything out of selfish ambition. Don't put other people down so that you can get ahead. All right? Don't have an exaggerated view of your own importance, but instead value others above yourself. Don't just look out for your own interests, but look out for the interests of others. Don't have a me-first philosophy. Have an others-first philosophy. Because we are never more like Satan than when we are selfish, and we are never more like Christ than when we are selfless. I heard a story about a mom who was cooking pancakes for her two boys, ages five and three. Kevin was the five-year-old, Ryan was the three-year-old, and so she starts cooking pancakes, and they start arguing over who's going to get the first pancake, the same argument that takes place in my house every Saturday when we do pancakes, right? They're fighting over who's going to get the first pancake, and so the the mother decides, you know, this is going to be a great teaching opportunity for my kids, and so she said, you know what? If Jesus was here, I think he would say, you know what? My brother can have the first pancake. I'll wait. And so Kevin, the five-year-old, said, Ryan, you can be Jesus. (laughs) Putting others first isn't easy, right? Looking out for the interests of others isn't easy to do because we live in a world where people are only interested in themselves. You ever gotten a a letter in the mail from a credit card company and in bold red letters, it's like no interest. I'm like, wow, a credit card company wants to give me money and they don't want me to pay any interest whatsoever? All right, I gotta see this deal. And then you open up the letter and you read the fine print only to discover it's all about the interest, right? Now I know what they mean when they say no interest. It means they have no interest in me whatsoever. They're only interested in my money. That's what no interest means, right? Anytime someone, there's an offer saying no interest payments, they're lying to you, right? Nobody's giving out free money. They are ripping you off somewhere. You better read that fine print because they are only interested in themselves. That's the world we live in. But if you want to experience true joy, you can't just be interested in yourself. You have to become interested in others. This is the unlikely path to joy. Uh, Dr. Carl Menninger was a famous psychiatrist. He founded the Menninger Clinic. He even opened up a school to train other psychiatrists. He's had one of the most profound impacts on psychiatry in America than probably any other single individual. And one time he was being interviewed, and the interviewer said, you know, hey, if you had, you know, somebody that you knew was on the verge of having a nervous breakdown, what would you tell them to do? And everyone expected him to say, go see a psychiatrist, because he'd given his life to psychiatry. But that wasn't his response. Instead, he said, I would tell that person to go find somebody who's in need and do something to help them. In other words, if someone's on the verge of a nervous breakdown, they need to get the focus off of themselves and put it onto others. Isn't this the cure for so much of what ails our world today? It's just to get the focus off of ourselves and put it onto others. Because when you get the focus off of yourself and you put it onto others, you experience greater levels of joy, peace, and contentment in your life. Because this is how God designed and wired us to live. This is how Jesus lived. It wasn't in it for what he could get out of it, but what he could give to others. And this is why he was the most happy, joyful person to ever walk the planet. I don't know what your picture of Jesus is, but he wasn't some grumpy, sour face, looking like he got baptized in lemon juice person, all right? Hebrews 1.9 tells us that he was anointed with the oil of joy more than anyone else on the planet. He walked in more joy than anyone else. Why? Because he knew that life is not about me. It's about others. He was the most joyful person on the planet because he was the most humble person on the planet. Verse five, it says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
So Jesus is set forth here as the example of humility. And, and the, the example that he uses is the incarnation, all right, when God became man. The theological term is incarnation. The root word for uh, incarnation is carne. It, it, it's the same word you see on cans of chili. Come on, how many love some chili? Anybody love chili? Yeah. Yeah, if you go to the store, they have chili, and then they have chili con carne, right? And guys, what is chili con carne? Chili with meat. That's right. All right, only like two guys know that, all right? They're <laughs> chili con carne, chili with meat, Somebody like, why are you talking about chili? I'm gonna show you how chili reflects the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ because everything <laughs> reflects the glory of God. Some of you wondering, did this guy really go to Bible school? Yes, but I went in South Georgia where I learned redneck theology, all right? <laughs> and so that's what you're gonna get here. <laughs> the word carne means meat. Carne, root word for incarnation. So Jesus is God with meat. There you go. There's your redneck theology right there. The incarnation is when the God who is spirit put on our humanity, entered into a physical body, that Jesus set aside his divinity to put on our humanity. Now, that does not mean that he ceased to be God. He just set aside his divine attributes and rights as God. It doesn't mean that he did not possess them. He just chose not to access them even though he had them. So even though he was fully God, he did not live on earth as God. He lived on earth as a man, that the creator became one with his creation, that he left his throne to be with us, that surrounded by angels in glory, he came and was surrounded by people who disrespected, mocked, abused, and ultimately crucified him. Now, in order to understand and comprehend the absolute humility of Jesus, you have to understand that when he was born in Bethlehem, he put on a permanent physical body. That when Jesus became one of us, it's not like he died and then put off his humanity and now he's, you know, God now. No, when he entered into a physical body, he did so permanently. He entered into a physical body in which there is no escape. When Jesus died, he died physically. When he rose from the grave, he rose physically. When he ascended to heaven, he ascended physically. When he sat down at the right hand of God, he sat down physically. And when he comes back, he's coming back physically. He entered into our humanity forever. He entered into a physical body. He so identified with us that he said, I will be identified with them for all of eternity. He entered into, put on our humanity forever. The absolute humility of God. I struggle to find the words to, to, to articulate all that meant in God becoming one of us. And that's not even to get to the most humble act in the history of all mankind, the cross. That God was willing to be murdered by his own creation. It doesn't make sense. What kind of God would allow his own creation to murder him? But he did it to save us from our sins, to rescue us, and to reconcile us back to God. The humility of Jesus is unbelievable. And here's the crazy part. Paul said, I want that same mindset that was in Jesus, I want that to be in you. I don't want you to do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Then instead of trying to go higher, I want you to go lower. Instead of trying to climb your way to the top, I want you to go all the way down to the bottom and see how many people you can lift to the top. This is the unlikely path to joy. Verse 9. Therefore, because Jesus was willing to humble himself even to death on the cross, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That because Jesus was willing to humble himself, God highly exalted him, because God always exalts the humble. In the kingdom of God, the way up is down. That the low road to humility is actually the path to promotion. The low road of humility is the path to promotion. And a couple years ago, my wife went on a mission trip to France with our church. And so she went to Paris and I stayed at home with the kids. And uh, while she was there, uh, the team, they visited the Eiffel Tower. And so if you've never been to the 
Eiffel Tower, um, I haven't, but uh, I, I, I know enough about it now. Um, so there's three levels to the Eiffel Tower. Uh, you can get to levels one and two by taking the stairs, but if you wanna get to level three, the very top, there's an elevator that you take that goes all the way up to the top. And so she wanted to go to the very top, and so she was in line at the elevator, but it was a really long line, and so she thought, you know what, I'll just take the stairs and I'll walk up to the second level. And so she you know, took the stairs, walked up to the second level of the Eiffel Tower, and she calls me from the Eiffel Tower, and it's like lit up at night, it's beautiful, right? It's like one of like the romantic places in the world, and I'm just like home with the kids, thinking, oh my gosh, I so wish I was there you know, with you to experience this moment. And she's like, oh no, you don't. I'm like, what? she's like, oh, it's awful. We had to walk all the way up here using the stairs. I've been walking upstairs for the last 30 minutes. I said, Bryn, are you really complaining about spending the last 30 minutes climbing the stairs of the Eiffel Tower? I just spent the last 30 minutes cleaning the tub because your son pooped in it. <laughs> I don't want to hear about how tiring it was walking up the Eiffel Tower. Like, get, get out of here with that nonsense. Don't come at me with that. We're here with these kids all week. You're at the Eiffel Tower. Oh, my gosh. Right? But if, if you want to go to Eiffel Tower, if you want to go to level one, level two, you just take the stairs straight up. But if you want to get to the elevator that goes all the way to the top, you actually have to go down because the elevator is actually below the Eiffel Tower. And so you go down to the elevator, and if you go down, you can access that elevator, which takes you all the way up to the top. See, there are so many people who want to get to the top. They want to be successful. They want to make a name for themselves. And so they take the stairs, and they can get to level one. And if they really want to work hard, like my wife, 30 minutes, you know, going up all them stairs, you can get to level two, right? Like all of their strength, ingenuity, creativity, it can get them to level two. But God has an elevator for you that will take you all the way to level three. God has an elevator that will take you all the way to the top. But the only way to access God's elevator is to go down, is to go to a place of humility. And if you are willing to go low, you are willing to take on the role of a servant, and you are willing to humble yourself, then God will exalt you, and he'll take you higher than you could ever go on your own. Because in the kingdom of God, the way up is down. Jesus said it this way. Luke 14, 11, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So if you try to exalt yourself, you try to make a name for yourself, you make it all about you, God's going to push you lower and lower and lower. But if you choose the low road and you humble yourself, then God will exalt you and he'll take you higher than you could ever go on your own. God has no problem exalting people. God has no problem making your name great. It says that God, that's what God told Abraham. He said, I will make your name great. God has no problem with your name being great, with people knowing who you are and your name and what you've accomplished. As long as it's, you don't make it all about you, as long as you don't care about any of those things, he'll give it all to you. But if you care about those things, he'll just keep taking you lower and lower until you realize none of that stuff matters. But when God exalts you and he takes you to the top, boy, there's joy at the top that way. So how do we practically live this out? How do we make sure that we don't just you know, look out for our own interests? How do we put other people before ourselves? How do we follow in the example of Jesus by living a life of humility? It's by serving others. In serving, you put others first. And every week we're faced with opportunities to serve people. Every day we have opportunities to serve our family, our loved ones, our neighbors, our coworkers, people in need. There are, are countless opportunities to serve. But if you're anything like me, you'll hear a message like this and go, all right, I'm gonna put others first. I'm not gonna make it all about me. I'm gonna start doing stuff for other people. And you do, you'll do good for like three days. Or if you're better than me, which you probably are, you might go three weeks. But eventually, you're gonna find yourself drifting back into selfishness, drifting back into a place when you look at, yeah, at your time, when you look at your money, when you look at your life, everything you do is for yourself and nothing is for others. And so what we need is a place where we can consistently look out for the interests of others. We need a place where we can consistently put others first. We need a place where we are consistently scheduled to serve others. So that way, when we start to drift towards selfishness, we have something that pulls us back and anchors us to putting other people first. It needs to be something that's scheduled on your calendar every week or every two weeks or every month. This has to be something consistently scheduled because if you don't have that 
thing on your calendar, you will drift into selfishness. And I think this is the greatest, one of the greatest gifts that our church can give you. I mean, outside of listening to me preach every week, one of the greatest gifts, <laughs> that was a joke. I probably can't make prideful jokes when I'm preaching on humility. It just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, you know, one of the greatest gifts that our church can give you is that place, is a place to look out for the interests of others, a place where you can come and not just receive, but come to give your life away in service to other people. I think it's the greatest gift that the local church can give to any person. And so if you have that place outside of this church, that's great, it doesn't have to be here, but if you don't have a place where you are consistently investing in other people, serving other people, looking out for the interests of other people, where you are sacrificing your time, talent, and treasure for the sake of others, we would love to have you do that right here. We have over 100 different places where you can serve on, on Sundays and throughout the week and in our community. And so if you're interested in doing that here, your next step is Discover. And so our next Discover class is happening on June 5th uh, at our third service, the 12 o'clock service in the room right across from the cafe. But Discover is simply about helping you discover the gifts God has given you and how God is wired you because we're all about serving, but we don't wanna just serve you in the place where we need people the most, like out in the parking lot, right? Uh, we do need help out there, but you know, we, we want to find out how God has gifted you and wired you and put you in the place where he's uniquely designed you to serve and make a difference in the lives of other people because that is where you find the most joy when you are doing that thing that God created you and wired you to do. But we want everyone to experience the joy of serving because when you take the focus off of yourself and you put it onto others, you experience greater levels of joy, peace, fulfillment, and contentment in life. That when you humble yourself and seek the happiness of others, you find serious joy for yourself. If you guys would please bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God, I wanna give you the opportunity to do that right now. Because as you've heard, God became one of us. He humbled himself. He went so low as to, to, to that, to that he would die on a cross for you, that he would die so that you could be forgiven, so that you could have a relationship with God here and now in the hope of heaven when this life is over. And on that cross, he took your sin, he took your mistakes, your failures upon himself so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be reconciled back to God. And so if you're here today, and you've never asked Jesus to be the leader and the forgiver of your life, you've never asked him to come into your life to forgive you and make you new again, I wanna give you the opportunity to do that right now. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. I'm not gonna you know, call you out or ask you to come forward or do anything, but I do just wanna know who I'm praying for today. So if that's you, would you just slip your hand up in the air so I know who I'm praying for today? Thank you, ma'am, I see your hand right there. Thank you, anyone else? Thank you, ma'am, I see that hand right there, thank you. Thank you, ma'am, I see that hand. Anyone else? Anyone else? Just slip your hand up in the air. I just wanna pray for you. I know there's, there's one more in the service. Thank you, sir, thank you, thank you. I knew there was one more. Thank you, you can put that hand right back down. Thank you. Thank you, sir, thank you. Thank you in the back, thank you. Yes, God, I pray for those who lifted their hands in this moment. God, I thank you that they're acknowledging their need for you their need of a savior. And so God, I know that as they lift their hand, they responded to you, God, that I thank you that they're choosing to trust in you, that you are forgiving them, you're healing them, you're restoring them, you're making all things new again. I know, I know there was somebody here that you, when you raise your hand, you thought, man, there's no way that God can forgive me. And you don't understand the power that is in the blood of Jesus that we sang about. It has the power to wash our sin away and make us white as snow. That when you trust in Jesus, God does not even remember your sin any longer. And so you need to know that when you leave this place, you are as clean as snow. That God does not remember it because Jesus paid for it. And so God, I pray right now that you would fill them with your spirit that you would empower them to overcome the challenges that they're up against in their life. God, I thank you for the new life that they are experiencing as they trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together for the seven people who made decisions to follow Jesus today? We are so excited for you and you, that decision you made. Uh, we would love for you to stop by our information desk right outside these doors. We just want to give you a book called Fresh Start to help you get started in this new journey. If you guys would please stand to your feet.
I'm going to pray over you, and uh, if you're here and you specifically need someone to pray with you, you want someone to believe God with you for something or anything in your life whatsoever or in your family, our prayer team is right here up front. We would love to pray with you and believe God for you. So whenever I dismiss you, if you need prayer, you can just come to the front and we would love to pray with you. Let me pray over you. God, I thank you for your absolute humility, God, that the the most underrated quality and aspect of who you are, that you are God, but you are a humble God. And so God, I pray that that same mindset would be taken on by this group of people here today, God, that we would humble ourselves, that we would go lower so that you can lift us higher, God, that, that we wouldn't just be focused about ourselves and what we have going on in our lives, God, but God, that we would take the spotlight off of ourselves and begin to shine it upon others. And God, I pray that as we take the focus off of ourselves, God, I pray that you begin to highlight and make us aware of the needs and the places and the people for us to serve, for us to lift up, for us to bless, for us to encourage God. That we wouldn't just look through life looking what we can get out of it, but we would look to where we can give, where we can be like Jesus in our families, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, and in our church community. God, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.